and it's a question that's come up a lot of times with other communities also is that um, when a huge destructive development project has been offered to the community most of those people who have bought into that um, that idea of development usually ask the alternative question which yeah. is you know so what are the alternative is there for yeah. us to have an, uh, to develop our economy in our country if, yeah. if you remove this from us so yeah. uh, basically my question would be um, what is your response to that argument yeah. of um, extractive industry, the export and formal sector being yeah. the way forward for economic development. And what would be your response or your yeah. view on that? Yeah. Well, that was indeed a lot of the purpose of the book when I started writing it many years ago, really, um, was to see what were the options, what were the best economic options for rural families, basically. Um, and in particular, comparing some of the options that were already, already existed in the country, but not everyone knew about them, um, and uh, you know there was anecdotal evidence I heard about some people doing very well uh, managing their their own land. And so, um, at some stage, with my PNG friends, we started to study the options more systematically. Um, there'd been some studies done before, and we did some surveys of informal markets, domestic markets, uh, mainly women in roadside markets. But looking at all the other options and looking at the options in the formal sector and looking at the, um, the factories and, um, and the mines and um, the shops and so on, and the village oil palm schemes, the way that families were participating and putting some of their land into oil palm schemes, looking at all of those sorts of options, basically the evidence is very strong that none of the formal sector options in rural PNG are better than the options being developed by families who manage their own land well and have a strong focus on domestic markets but also participate in small business and to a lesser extent export markets. Um, and the way I put that all together in the book is to say the good hybrid livelihoods, hybrid livelihoods are really the ways in which people combine um, using their own gardens for, for feeding their families and um, engaging in domestic markets which are overwhelmingly more important in money terms to them than export markets. Even though export markets, you know, cocoa and coffee for example, are important and popular, people participate in them, but they don't get as much money from them as they do from the domestic markets. And so it was very common for example to see, uh, not that everyone does very well out of domestic markets, some uh, mothers go there and get a small amount of money but some of them get very good amount of money. And it was interesting to see that in, whether it was in East New Britain, or in Madang, or in Eastern Highlands, or in Morobe, they were the four provinces we looked at domestic markets in. Within those markets, there were always a group of people that were doing quite well. A group of people that were getting quite low incomes, but a group that was doing quite well. And it was interesting to see the strategies they were using. Um, basically, some women that were really had a, they were growing some, produce in their gardens specifically as cash crops and not just selling what was left over from the produce of their gardens for what, they were, what their family was eating. And so they would be focusing on melons or peanuts or taro or cucumbers but they had a cash crop that was really for, so they had a plan for cash and quite often those people were earning 100, 200, 300 kina a week in those areas, you know. Some others are getting less but some were earning quite good money, some thousand or more kina a week, you know. And in Medang, for example, they were going to markets on average of three days a week. In the Highlands more, in the Highlands they were going five days a week, you know. So this all varied depending on where you were and, and the crops varied a little bit. But it was clear from looking at different provinces that there were very good opportunities in domestic markets. And most of those women and their families we also had small business, like chicken businesses and small stores and things like that. And most of them also engaged in, in export, or growing export crops in their, on their customary land too. So the, really the question was, the superior incomes were always coming from people that were managing their customary land as a basis for their livelihoods. By livelihoods I mean food from their gardens, um, money from domestic crops, money from small business, money from 
some money from export crops too, and sometimes family was had a job, was working in the, the formal sector. Sometimes people who were working in jobs, even full-time employment, were also managing their gardens and getting good income from their gardens as well. So that's what I mean by hybrid, that there was a combination of sources of income and sustenance for the family. Um, and those people were getting much, much better income than those that were engaged with the formal sector. What I mean by the formal sector, village oil palm, mamalous fruit, engaged with the oil palm sector, working in the stores, working in um, getting jobs in tuna factories or uh, mining or some of those other industries as, as employment, um, working in some big chicken businesses in Morobe, for example. Whatever those incomes were, maybe some of them were as low as 40 and 50 kina, some were 100, 120 kina. They were never as good as the hybrid livelihoods based on customary land that had a range of options. And the customary land was the base of that. The worst option of all, leasing out your customary land. The rents are very poor, very, very poor, you know. And people know this, I think. People know this. But I think people get, conf so I don't want to preach to Papua New Guinea people as a, as a guest in the country about this. Just that if you look at the economic data, the promises that are made to people sometimes, misleading promises, let's say, um, about, well, if you put over two or four hectares of your land to oil palm and sell it to the company, you'll have better houses and cars and we'll loan you 10,000 kina to plant all this sort of stuff. They weren't getting what was promised there. Um, the, the oil palm monoculture in particular more so than even coffee or, or cocoa, it, it's a very inflexible crop. You can't do other things with it. You can't grow other plants with it. You know, there were a lot of environmental problems. But also the, the income was lower. You know, the income was not good. Um, we did do some surveys of uh, some years back, um, eight or nine years ago, of oil palm farmers in, in uh, Papandetta Plains in Ora. Um, some of them were getting... Some, the, the best incomes were middle level incomes, you know, but they were never as good as the good hybrid incomes of people that kept their customary land and kept a range of options based on land, you know. There was no good option for people selling off, uh, leasing their land or even giving over large amounts of their land, substantial amounts of their land to, um, to, the, oil, to the monocultures that the companies were controlling. The companies, of course, were making fairly good money out of the oil palm and exporting the oil palm. That, that's why they wanted it. But the families themselves, and this is one of the other general argument in my book, is to say that any any discussion of the economy in PNG has to be based on families' livelihoods. Huh? What, is, what meaning does an economy have if it isn't to do with how families are doing in terms of livelihoods? And by livelihoods, I mean also the things that they have to support, the school fees, or the auxiliary fees or the other sorts of costs, um, the health, the costs of health um, services, those sorts of things. You know. uh, always the best options were in these hybrid livelihoods where families kept their own customary land and learned the better practices of farm management and how to get the best value out of their land, not giving it over to a company or to uh, uh, some other operation.